Uh, so welcome everyone to our session on implementing contemplative practices to help students slow down, connect, and learn a pedagogy of care. There is some irony in us rushing through telling you how to slow down. Um, that's not lost on any of us, but we have um, a good group here that participated in a learning circle that read the book, um, Contemplative Practices in Higher Education there on the screen. And we're just gonna go through, we'll introduce ourselves briefly and kind of talk about essentially why we decided to be interested in this topic and maybe a takeaway. So we're gonna move fairly quickly through our panel and uh, then leave some time for questions for, for sure. So I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the social work department, the new social work department. We were part of sociology and anthropology till this summer. Now we're our own department. I facilitated this learning group, proposed this book initially, and I was not sure anybody would want to come to this group. I wasn't quite sure what the reception would be um, for a evidence-based contemplative practice um, book group. So I have uh, cultivated a, a private individual personal practice for about 10 years of mindfulness and have found it very beneficial. And I had started using some mindfulness breathing exercises um, in different settings with students and in presentations I would do with high school students, with my, my own children, I experimented with them. So I was kind of using this a little bit and finding that it was very useful in helping my students, particularly in my Monday morning class as they were rushing into the week to slow down, take a few mindful breaths. Sometimes we would do a seven to 10 minute meditation and really just center themselves in their own learning and like, okay, for the next couple of hours, here's where I'm at. I can be present here and I can devote my attention. There's a lot of the planning mind and what am I gonna have for lunch and all of those things that go on, especially on that Monday morning. So slowing down the students and really getting ourselves into the room physically as well as mentally and emotionally was really important and really helping the students connect to their inner and outer world. So that's what draws, that's what draws me to this topic. One of the things I'm going to do in the future with this topic, there's a section in the book on deep listening practices. And that's a fundamental part of social work is deep listening. And there's some nice mindfulness-based practices where, where we uh, pair students up and we really practice listening deeply, not listening to how I'm gonna respond or how I'm gonna be right in this conversation, but really listening to understand. So I haven't done as much of that as I would like. So that's one thing I'll be using uh, going forward from this particular topic. So Karin. Sorry, I started talking while still on mute. Jeff, I was going to start with saying, I'm so grateful that you chose this book and that you offered to facilitate this group because this is a really undervalued topic, I think, in higher education. And I'm so glad for everything we learned and discussed together as a group. For me personally, I've long known that slowing down is good for learning. Just like there's the slow food movement to help us really enjoy what we're actually experiencing with our nose and our taste buds and our eyes. I think it's very good for our education to slow down and really savor what we're doing. So contemplation in all its many forms and its very practices is a great way. And the one thing that I realized I was already doing, which a lot of us had these aha moments in the learning circle, like, wait, I'm already doing that. I didn't know it was a contemplative practice. I have a lot of uh, reflective writing prompts for students where they connect their experience with the topics they're reading about in my courses. So that's been super wonderful and validating to see that, yeah, I'm doing contemplative practices already, ha. So I'm happy to talk about that more, but here comes um, Jessica. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Rivera Mueller. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English and building off of what Karen just said, um, I had a very similar experience where, you know, I joined the conversation because I just wanted to have purposeful conversations with my colleagues about 
you know, teaching and learning with folks who care about teaching and learning. Um, and I was feeling stressed <laughs> living and working, um, homeschooling, all those things during the pandemic. And so I just wanted to connect with folks um, about teaching. And so when I started the Learning Circle, I realized that some of my favorite reading and writing practices actually have roots in contemplative practice. And I had forgotten that. I knew that a long time ago. I had read like Parker Palmer and Mary Rose O'Reilly, but I haven't visited them in a long time. And so this was a really cool opportunity for me to revisit those folks and think about who I was when I first encountered those ideas and who I want to be as I continue to grow as an educator. And so through my conversations with um, the folks in this group, I created sort of five you know, principles that are serving as guideposts for me so that as I continue to use these activities, I can be more purposeful in foregrounding the contemplative underpinnings of these particular exercises. And so I just thought I would share those things with you all today as a way of encouraging you to think about how contemplative practice might also support what you're already doing um, in your teaching. And so if you wanna sort of look into this topic further. So these are my summaries, but they're the ways I'm articulating why I'm drawn to this as I continue to refine my practices. So I'll just close by sharing those. Contemplative teaching values process, exploration, and the journey of learning thereby pushing against narrow visions of outcomes-oriented teaching and learning. Contemplative teaching prompts learners to slow down, look a little closer, and reread, thereby supporting our sense of wonder and connection to others. Contemplative teaching helps learners better understand how they construct meaning. Contemplative teaching connects learners with the world around and beyond them. Contemplative teaching values silence as much as speech. Contemplative teachers are explicit about their use of contemplative practice. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Victoria Grieve from the History Department. Um, and I was drawn to this initial learning circle for two reasons. First of all, I think like many of us, um, were struck by the lack of uh, the ability of our students to focus deeply on their work these days. And I was kind of, I've been trying to find solutions to that for the past several years. Uh, and the other is that I'm teaching a class this fall on civil rights. It's the first time I'll teach this class and I'm a little anxious given the current political climate of how that classroom experience will go. Um, so, um, I came to this learning circle looking for specific strategies. And the one that I think impressed me most, um, I think there's empirical evidence to support this. And after talking to a lot of colleagues, both in the learning circle and out, um, I think there's a lot of evidence that just supports the value of a simple moment, as, as Jefferson said, of being present in the space when you walk into the classroom. And so I'm just going to try a moment of silence, a moment of breathing to, um, to focus students in the class on difficult material and to sort of build trust and connections among that group so that when we get to hard stuff, um, there's a sense of, of community already present. So I'm hoping it'll lead to some positive class interactions um, as well as a really more focused learning experience for my students and for myself. Oh, two other things that I think are important here. One, uh, you know, so those are the academic benefits, but I also think, cause I'm teaching connections in a few weeks as well. And I've asked someone to come in and lead a, uh, a meditation, a mindfulness sort of um, practice for the students, because I think this is a transferable skill, right? It's not just good in my civil rights class. You could, they can take this with them to lots of different places. So I think in the current conversation of mental health, um, struggles among our current students, that's also a transferable skill that we can give them in every class that they take. Okay, I'm done, thanks. <laughs> Hello, my name is Lacey Bruschetto and I am an assistant professor for the Applied Sciences Technology Education Department. Just a heads up, if you ever see a learning circle where Jeff is leading, participate because we actually started many of our discussions with some of the meditation and breathing practices, which coincidentally, the time of the meeting was a wreck right in the middle of the day when we're super tense and overwhelmed. And it just allowed us to pause and calm down and clear our minds. So we had really good productive conversations. So I thought it was, just, it was an excellent segue into 
getting deep, you know, into what we analyze for the book. So I decided to participate in this learning circle. I'm a big person on teaching the whole student. And I thought this was a great way to incorporate more strategies. So the students recognize that I saw them, that I heard them. And therefore, when I presented my information to them, they would be more willing to appreciate um, the effort that I took to connect them to the material. And like Karen mentioned, a lot of us realize that we're already doing this. We're already doing many of these, but we found ways that we could enhance them. Um, one of the strategies that I connected with the most was beholding, which is just really practicing the seeing and the observation of something um, without having all the context behind it. And in higher ed, that subjectivity can be kind of a sticky thing, um, especially, you know, we have certain learning outcomes that we really need to get done. But I felt it was really interesting. And one of the quotes I've connected to in the book says, out of subjectivity, true objectivity arose. And so that's something that I really liked because I was able to, from this book and from just, I guess, enhancing my awareness of what beholding is, I was able to take a current assignment that I was already doing, but extend it through the whole semester so that the students can continuously revisit it over and over and over again, and then reflect back on how they've enhanced and how they've grown with understanding the content. So that's what I've gotten out of this book. I recommend it. Uh, I wasn't ready for my picture to show up. <laughs> Thanks, Lacey. The, so I am like some of you, um, when I saw this circle, I thought I should be there because uh, many of you that are already in the circle, that were in the circle were my friends. So I knew that this would be a safe place to be and that I would learn something. And so I looked at the topic of contemplation and realized that I, I wasn't sure if I was a, if I knew how to be contemplative and how it would help me in my, in my teaching. But I looked at the book and then I flipped through and saw the topics and I was really searching if there's something that I am already familiar with. And so the, the chapter that spoke to me was the topic in chapter nine of compassion and loving kindness. That was something I could relate to right away. And I don't think we can have too much compassion or loving kindness in higher education. It's just not possible, especially the kind of institution where we are, where it's, you see people from different backgrounds, they come to class, they come to school with um, experiences that are maybe not the same as ours, and yet they depend on us as faculty to facilitate their learning. So I, I, I knew I could relate to that. And, and so that's, that's my gratitude for um, having the opportunity to learn about being more contemplative and how I could influence my students, hopefully, to uh, benefit from that. And also being able to um, learn more about something that I was already doing. Um, as I mentioned, I am a product of other people's compassion and loving kindness in higher education. I, there, there is, I don't, no matter how you measure it, I wasn't supposed to be here. That's kind of how I summarize it in my head. And yet I am here because a lot of people helped me along the way. And, and that goes back to my mother's womb and the conditions where I was born and how I was taught. And you could, you could say that I have been a recipient of that. And so, however, I can share that more broadly. Uh, that's been my goal in higher education. And this, this circle helped me to, um, to learn more ways that I can be better at um, being contemplative about um, being more compassionate and showing more loving kindness to my students, hopefully to my coworkers and, and maybe to myself. Um, so that's, that's what I got out of it. And so I would highly recommend it. And 
that's really all I have to share. And oh, thank you. I was hoping the question and answer part would come up. So back to you, Jeff. Thanks, Sam. Well, might I suggest, actually, this would be a good time. I tell my students that there is always time for three mindful breaths. There's always time. They don't have to be long breaths. They don't have to be any kind of breath in particular. So perhaps we can just now just follow the next three inhales and exhales while you kind of let all of that information just settle just a little bit. And then we'll move into some questions and I'll have a couple more thoughts. So I'll stop talking and just follow the next three breaths that you have. So now maybe you can just kind of come back to the sound of my voice and we'll, we'll get ready to transition into some questions, but maybe you can just notice how even that short of period of time of silence made you feel. Some of you might've been uncomfortable. Some of you might've thought it was too long. Some of you might be too short. There's no right or wrong way to experience that, um, but just little pauses and silence, something the keynote speaker spoke about as well. It's just building in some silence. I think it goes along with beholding. It's like when you've covered a kind of a, an impactful topic that sometimes just sitting in silence as a group and letting it settle can be really, really powerful learning. Um, it gives the, the brain and the heart and the soul time to process some of these things. So I wanna just say, say one thing about the book. It's got a nice piece on the front end about some of the evidence that goes along with supporting these types of practices and the benefits for students learning and things like that. And then it kind of transitioned to some specific sections on different types of practices you might consider. And in all of that, the authors do address and acknowledge some of the challenges of these practices in a higher education system. So they're not blissfully unaware of some of the challenges that you might face with implementing some of these practices. They talk about um, different aspects of that in a, in a particular chapter. So it really is a nice uh, introduction to this topic. But with that being said, we would love uh, the panel to entertain any questions you might have about our experience or what's in the book or just thoughts you might have. So we'll just, uh, you can do that in the chat. If somebody can monitor the chat for us, we can just, you can unmute however you want to do it. So I have a question what, uh, for anybody. What were your students' reactions? Did they, they think this was a little goofy or did they maybe think it was goofy and then embrace it? Or how did they react to this, some of the, the um, techniques that you tried with them? So I'll start my students. This is of all of my um, qualitative comments on my observation or on my evaluations. The beholding part is the thing that they said that they actually wished. So I did this. Oh, I can't even remember what semester because I taught spring and summer, but they said that they wanted to do have me start earlier. And so that's why I am going to embed it doing the whole semester long because they loved it but it was kind of towards the end. And so I think they, they said that they would get more out of it. And I think I'd get more out of it too, so. Thanks Lacey and uh, others can go too. I just wanted to say that framing is everything. So I would frame it on the front end and I would introduce it from the evidence-based side of things like, hey, these are the things that mindfulness breathing can, can do for a body that's feeling anxious. And here's why presence is important. Now that may be a little easier for my audience because they are people coming into social work and wanting to be therapists. And so I often talk about how this is a great thing that you will do when you're in a clinical setting. Like if somebody says something to you, it kind of blows you out of the water. You can follow your breath as the therapist. You can do these things in real life, in real time. So I had some framing, but I definitely, I would frame it on the front end. I wouldn't just drop some of these practices without some context. I'll build off of that, Jeff, too. I teach teachers. And so they're also interested in these practices as mindfulness is increasingly important in K-12 settings as well. So I agree, just in my experience, it's just the framing of it can really help students understand how you know, these practices connect with what they hope for in their future. Jessica, you know, I think it's really cool about you teaching teachers is that you're modeling for them, right? So you're doing that with them and then they'll do that with theirs. And I think it's the same in social work. I was just thinking, I have students role play and do Socratic seminars and all these things where they have to perform in front of the class and they always get very anxious. 
And even though I am a clinician and I do this kind of stuff with clients, I never thought of just taking a minute before we start that and helping students kind of, you know, get connected and grounded. Um, I will say that um, in, for my connections class next week, I'm introducing, um, you know, this meditative workshop. It's a workshop on how to meditate, essentially. And it's grounded within the framework of um, um, modules on overcoming challenges and resilience. So I'm going to present it to them as a tool that they'll use throughout their college career to handle difficult situations and to handle stress and to handle all the anxiety that may come with with college for some students. So that's how I plan to frame it for our incoming students at the very least. King has an interesting question. I don't know, Kim, if you wanted to, to voice it out loud, but you you if you or there's more you want to say about it, but very varying, varying contemplative practices with a group versus developing more of a ritual with a particular practice and any thoughts from the panel. Anybody want to take that one? Um, in my reflective writing prompts, uh, let's take my class, Language and Religion, for example, where we examine uh, contemporary linguistic practices of practitioners of various world religions. And we read scholarly articles about specific groups. And I almost always ask students at the end, name two things that the group described here, as described here, has in common with your background and two ways in which you differ. And that is a way for them and, and sort of an into the text that they're not often asked, but it is connecting their experience with the course readings. And it, it conditions them to be aware of I have similarities with lots of people and I have differences with lots of people and it's up to me what I choose to focus on. I would just add that, you know, my students get used to the rituals. So because it's a Monday morning in a class again, they knew that the first five to 10 minutes, there would be some mindfulness breathing exercise. And, you know, I gave them permission. We were all on Zoom obviously, and they could turn their camera off. They could participate or not participate, no one would know if they were following their breath. And um, they just knew. And that also gave chance for those that might be a really kind of arriving late for whatever reason and all of those things, uh, an extra space that they knew that they could come in and people would just, they could just settle themselves um, before. And so the ritual piece, I think, worked well. There was nice comments about that being a lot of people's favorite thing about how we started class on my IDEA evaluation. So it, it seemed to go well. I could see in the right class and context, you might try a sample of some of these things. You might do some of the reflective writing, you might do some breathing. It really is context dependent, I would say. Um, the other piece, somebody just asked a question about resources. I, I actually, there's some uh, from the Happify group, there's some little animations about what meditation is and is not. And I would show that on the front end uh, to kind of dispel any myths about what meditation might be. And then I used some, some basic guided meditations that are available out there on different apps to introduce my students to these um, things. And I would try to use, based on feedback from students, different, um, different voices. So um, those that would be perceived as female or male or non-gendered, um, that was a request from a student. It really was a great comment. And so I worked to kind of give them a diversity of guided meditations. And then sometimes I would just lead them myself. I had a quick question about the format of the book. Like Jessica, I teach teachers. Is the book formatted in such a way that um, it would be easy to excerpt a, a chapter or a section where they get some of this actual practice? Or is it is it really uh, more com complex that you need to read more of the book in order for an individual section to make sense? I'm gonna loan you my copy of the book so you can make that determination. Okay, 
saw one question in the chat about using this these practices with undergraduate and graduate students. I have. I haven't noticed like a difference. I think it's like all learning activities, at least in my experience, that some folks are more, you know, have different, you know, prior knowledge and experience with things and are able to dig in quicker than others. But I haven't really noticed, you know, a huge difference in terms of how eager or not folks are. I don't know if others on the panel have had those experiences. I'm not on this panel and this may not be relevant to this specific thing, but I think uh, at conferences, a lot of times I feel like they talk about graduate students and, and there's a lot of focus on that, but a lot of things that they discuss, I will give to bachelor's level students, you know, to undergraduate students. And I, I really do feel like even if it requires some modification, uh, depending on the assignment that, you know, I, I don't see why they wouldn't and why we shouldn't be pushing them and and helping them you know grow in many different ways so and i i did mine primarily with my undergrads um my grad classes are all online but jeff just put a link in there um, i did embed some of those videos um, about meditation into my grad modules though, to start one of their modules kind of during the, those really tense moments of the semester where I, you know, could feel and just, I could feel their anxiety. So, um, but I didn't get any response on my evaluations feedback from them, whether or not they thought that was useful. And I, as far as feedback, I will say I did add a question on my mid semester evaluations that I do about this and whether it was working or not, so I could like stop if it was really bothering somebody. Um, but they all really loved it and asked that we continue and in fact there were a couple classes where I didn't practice what I preach and I kind of came rushing in and had so many things I wanted to get done and everything and I just kind of jumped in and they were like time out aren't we going to do some breathing first. And I was like. Yeah, there's always time for three breaths. Okay. I did say that, didn't I? So um, it's it's an ongoing practice that we can cultivate, but it's nice that the students reminded me that I was getting ahead of myself and that I probably ought to slow down and center myself. Um, so that's when you kind of know as a teacher, right? That, oh, they're really, they're really internalizing this. Um, so I thought that was nice. Um, we've got probably time for one one more question or so, if anybody has one. And then let's not forget our plug after the final question. Oh, I'm gearing up for it, Karin. I'm, I'm ready to unleash that. I guess I, I don't have a question. I just, as I look through this, I have a comment. You know, several years ago, ETE highlighted a presenter or an author that talked about introducing an opening pause, a mid pause and a closing pause. And I just think, this is right in line with that, but in a different way. It, you know, I've been doing the pauses for all the all these years now, but I can see the value of just taking that opening pause and making it this meditative practice, or you know, just recentering. Um, I don't know. And then again, I think, well, maybe it's even better at the midpoint, you know, and everybody's like totally zoning out. I don't know. I just think this is a great integration. So I haven't read this book yet. And now clearly I have more reading to do, but I do think if you're on this session and you haven't read, read hitting pause, her research for pausing in lecture to recenter students is so on point. And I, everything that's been said here today completely backs that up, but in a, in a different way, rather than knowledge-based transfer and understanding, this is more of, we're just gonna get our crap together <laughs> and try not to, you know, perpetuate, you know, the anxiety that prevents us from learning. Anyway, a great session, love this. Thank you, Rose. So last 30 seconds, uh, I do get the chance to coordinate the learning circles 
for ETE, if you haven't facilitated one or you haven't suggested a book, this is the link Karn's got here. You can go directly into the ETE Canvas page. You can suggest a book. We've just redone the survey, so it'll ask you. You can just suggest and like, no, I don't want to facilitate. It's really lovely when you suggest something and you're willing to facilitate. And facilitation is not, um, we, we've designed it to not be overly burdensome. And there's some resources about how to do that and a little guide that we put together. Um, I talked Jen into doing it and she did it with a co-facilitator and did a fantastic job. So if you have books, if you have ideas, doesn't have to be in this topic area, fill out this survey. We'll get a hold of you. Um, we've got our fall sessions full, but you'd be kind of suggesting a book for spring. Um, so it's a great way to get um, involved and contribute. So that's the plug. Thank you so much ever for being here. We appreciate your time. Oh, we've got a quick question from Kim. Sorry, just a quick plug for any of you that are interested in doing this. I just am totally bandwagoning and riding on your coattails. Um, we, the Journal of Empowering Teaching Excellence is opening up to having one book review per edition per issue. And Karen, I have an email drafted for you actually sitting in my boilerplate. Uh, we're working on an actual rubric simply for um, the book reviews. We've sort of been winging it based on uh, a book review that Karen did for me about a year and a half ago. But if you're interested in, um, in doing that, uh, then you can earn ETE badges for um, contribution if you'll, if you'll do a book review that are happening in the learning circle. So you can just email me if you need more information until I get a, uh, a better rubric up on the journal page. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Sorry, thank you. No worries. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate your time and attendance. Thanks. Also, if you think you want to read this book with colleagues, you should totally just do another learning circle on this book. Ah. Yeah, that is absolutely um, doable. And ETE will buy the book for you. Yeah. And all right. of us are welcome to talk later offline if anybody wants to get a hold of us.